This is part one of a three-part series on patent law for inventors and scientists. Part one is the introduction and freedom to operate. Part two will be getting patents. And part three will be how not to lose patent rights. Uh, patents are intellectual property, which gives the owner the right to exclude others. Those are very important words. The right to exclude others from making, using, and selling the claimed invention. Notice nowhere does it say it gives the owner or the assignee the right to use the claimed invention. It does not give the owner the right to use the invention. This will become more apparent later. Each country issues its own patents. Therefore, if you want patents in Japan, South Korea, France, Belgium, uh, South Africa, Israel, etc., you have to file patent applications in each of those countries. Why do people obtain patents? Well, it depends very much on whether you're a sole inventor or a university or part of a large corporation. Generally, large corporations and small businesses uh, obtain patents to get true market exclusivity. I use the word true market exclusivity because if you got a patent on Viagra capsules, it would give you market exclusivity for Viagra capsules, but nobody would care. They would continue to sell Viagra tablets. And in essence, while you would have exclusivity for the capsules, you wouldn't really have true market exclusivity. Uh, universities, small businesses, and sole inventors, and probably many of you watching this, actually obtain patents not to develop the product so much, but as to license the product, your patent, and technology to large corporations to develop and then pay you a royalty. And there are some that obtain patents to get venture capital. All of you, I'm sure, are familiar with personal and real property rights. And intellectual property or patents are very similar in most aspects. However, there's three critical aspects in which they're different. One is your personal and real property generally has unlimited life, where a patent expires after 20 years. Further, your personal or real property is owned by only one party. In other words, if you own your car or your house, others cannot own it. As you'll see shortly, this is not the same for intellectual property and in particular patents. And this is why before when I said a patent gives the owner the right to exclude others, this is where it, it ties into. Also, with regards to your car or your property, once you own it, it's yours till you decide to dispose of it. However, your patent rights can disappear if a court uh, is asked to rule on a patent and declares it invalid your patent rights uh, disappear at that point. Freedom to operate is important, especially if you do not get a patent because either you never apply for one and just want to go to market, or you do apply for one and never get one and then ultimately still want to market. What you need to do is make sure you have freedom to operate. What that means is that you are not infringing the patent rights of any third party. And this also becomes important even if you get your own patent because as I mentioned before the patent does not give you the right to use your invention but only the right to exclude others. So it is possible to obtain a, a issued United States patent and still not have freedom to operate because you're infringing the rights of others. We'll take a look at an example to help you better understand this. Here's an actual example of where parties had patents and did not have freedom to operate because they would have been infringing the patents of others. Pharmacia owned a patent on a pharmaceutical called Freedox. Subsequently, Insight Vision obtained a patent claiming the use of Freedox for treating ophthalmic use. Insight could not make use or sell Freedox for ophthalmic use because they would have infringed the, the Pharmacia patent. Likewise, Pharmacia could not recommend the use of Freedox for ophthalmic use because they would have infringed the Insight Vision patent. Similarly, with the University of California, they could not sell Freedox for treating surgical adhesions because they would have been infringing the Pharmacia patent. Likewise, Pharmacia could not recommend the use of Freedox for treating surgical adhesions because they would have infringed the University of California patent. This does not happen often, but when it does, it can cause problems and it should be something that you're aware of. In order to determine whether or not you have freedom to operate, you need to do what's called an infringement search. Uh, 
Now, if you're interested in selling in the United States, you need to do the search of U.S. patents. Likewise, if you're interested in Japan, a search needs to be done of Japanese patents. The search has to be done of just those patents in the subject area of which you're interested and only going back 20 years. Any patents that may have claimed what you're doing that are older than 20 years have expired and are not relevant. And also, while reading the documents, one only needs to check the independent claims. So an infringement search goes fairly quickly. You only go back 20 years, only look at the independent claims of those patents that are in the subject area that you're interested in. While I'm discussing searching, I will include in here patentability searching. This is searching to determine whether or not your invention is patentable. Unlike the very limited inf infringement search, a patentability search is extremely broad. It, it includes when reading patents, not just the claims, but anything mentioned anywhere in the patent. It includes scientific journals, books, magazines, theses in libraries, and it has to be worldwide in all languages and goes back in time to Adam and Eve. So it includes everything that's known. In doing searching to determine whether your invention is patentable, it can be a little trickier than it looks, especially when searching worldwide, which you must, uh, because different languages don't always quite translate. If you were looking in, let's say, uh, Chinese documents to see if there was a giraffe and you put in the word giraffe, you would never find one. However, if you decided to put in the term deer with a long neck, you would find an animal which very much resembles what we call a giraffe. Similarly, if you were looking for a zebra, again, and you didn't find one, but put in there a uh, striped horse, you would find what we call a zebra. So be very careful when searching uh, and the terms you use, be, use broad terms, use terms that can, many different terms to, that may be used to describe the same thing.